Hello, I'm Marcus Louth and welcome to the latest edition of the UFO Insight Podcast, where we examine all things UFOs and aliens, conspiracies and mysteries, and all aspects of the paranormal. And today we'll be examining the many intriguing connections between UFO and alien encounters and other areas of the paranormal that might be more befitting in the world of ghosts and hauntings. And as we shall see, there are many more of these crossover encounters than many of us would imagine. Perhaps we should begin by examining details that are seemingly more at home in the world of the paranormal that are regularly reported alongside UFO and more specifically alien encounters. Although most don't realise it at the time, if indeed ever in some cases, many cases of repeat alien abduction often begin with signs more akin to paranormal activity. For example, many subductees report experiencing sudden problems with a whole manner of electrical equipment, usually while they are in the vicinity. Sometimes a television reception will become scattered, or an electronic device will simply short out. Or, some people might report small items, possibly jewellery or ornaments, simply going missing. Then, the objects will mysteriously and randomly reappear. These particular kinds of incidents often lead to people setting up makeshift cameras or CCTV in an attempt to capture the culprit on film. On occasion, this leads to more distress for the witness, but also offers us an insight into such bizarre activity. Many people who have taken to setting up such security cameras have often captured strange phenomena that most would instantly associate with the paranormal. Some people, for example, might record strange orbs moving about a certain room. Others might capture a blur or a mist, again something that would lead the witness to suspect they had captured footage of a ghost or an apparition. They would very likely be more inclined to think they had proof of life from the other side as opposed to life from far away, and maybe they might be correct. However, perhaps of all strange and chilling paranormal type phenomena captured on these types of homemade security missions are those of the shadow people, and they show up regularly in accounts featuring interactions with alleged aliens. Most of us will have heard of the shadow people, and most would probably agree that they sound more at home in occult or satanic circles. However, they appear in several alien abduction encounters. Perhaps one of the most famous is that of Kelly Cahill, who when being regressed to recall her abduction encounter, would state an experience with strange blacked out beings which were void of colour. Not only that, Cahill would further describe his endoses as not having a soul. Interestingly, however, Cahill would also describe what many people would relate to a tall, thin, grey alien. She would state that the entity was around 7 feet tall, with a large out-of-proportion head. However, she would also state that the creature had piercing red eyes. Of course, most would describe grey aliens as having almond black eyes. Reptilians, on the other hand, and sometimes werewolves or even Bigfoot creatures, often show up in reports with such glowing red eyes. Might this be something of importance? Although many researchers have theorised that there could be many different races of alien visiting the planet, might this be an example of all of these strange descriptions merging into one entity? Might shadow people simply be grey aliens, but in another form, almost like a shape-shifting of energies? Or maybe, even the grey aliens themselves, and certainly how we perceive them, is not their true form. Perhaps it is a case that to better understand what both aliens and other strange incidents of the paranormal actually are, we need to better understand the manifestation of energy. After all, according to Tesla, the secrets of the universe lay in understanding energy, frequency and vibration. So with all that in mind, what might the connection be between apparent ghosts and alleged aliens? We have examined before, for example, the notion of invisibility, and whether some strange accounts might be ones of aliens using either technology or a bizarre type of control of their bodies to render themselves invisible to humans. Or might it be, as we speculated briefly a moment ago, that aliens are actually energy-based, and as such, can control how the energy manifests, and at what frequency it manifests at. If, for example, the frequency is outside of what humans can see in the visual spectrum, then that entity wouldn't even exist to us. And even on a frequency just outside our range, we may only get a glimpse of them. This is perhaps interesting, as many people with apparent experience with encounters of shadow people claim for the most part to see them only for a brief moment, and even then, usually out of the very corners of their eye. Researcher and author David Icke explains the connection between what humans can see, or more to the point, what they can't, and the frequency that an energy manifests at. Remember, we ourselves, at the very basic level, are a manifestation of energy. 
it would make sense then that the laws of the universe would dictate that all life would be such manifestations, the only difference being at what frequency that manifestation takes place. Ike explains this using a radio as an example. When we tune into one station, we can only hear that one station. That doesn't mean, however, that the other stations suddenly stop broadcasting. We simply need to tune into them to hear them. This is the same with what we see. Our eyes see only that which manifests or vibrates at a certain frequency. However, other life, in Ike's example, reptilians, manifest at a different frequency. If we could all, like some people, such as psychics and mediums, adjust our vision, like we would adjust the radio to listen to a different station, then we would be able to witness these strange creatures for ourselves, and interact with them. In fact, there are plenty of reasons to connect such abilities and changes of perception with interaction with extraterrestrials, and quite possibly, as some researchers suggest, a purpose or suppression of such knowledge and ability. Might it be a case, though, that some people, for whatever reason, have regained access to this ability? To reach into the future to view events, and more important to our discussion here, to be able to witness other entities on realms that others simply can't. However, first, going back to the ability to interact with such entities, if we could tune into their frequency wave, the same is true the other way around, at least according to the theories and claims of David Icke. However, when these entities wish to interact with humans on our frequency, they require a physical body to do so. This is interesting, as some people insist that the grey alien is simply a suit or armour, essentially a body. Others, though, insist a more human frame is required. Perhaps we should turn our attention to some of the many alien abduction encounters that feature details more at home in the wider world of the paranormal. One of the most intriguing of these is that of Tracy Jones, as relayed to UFO researcher and author, the late Tony Dodd, in his book Alien Investigator. The bizarre happenings experienced by Tracy Jones had reached such intensity by the summer of 1997 that she contacted Dodd. After years of chilling incidents, also experienced by her husband Darren and their four children, they were reaching breaking point. Most likely, as we will see with some other similar cases, they had been happening for decades since Tracy was a child. What intrigued Dodd even more about Tracy Jones was that she was physically gifted. Whether this was a result of her experience or not is unknown. Upon first speaking to Dodd, however, she would describe the layout of his office and home even though she had never been there. She also had a sense of certain people or situations. She would state, however, that this power is not something that she can control. Perhaps part of the reason Tracy assumed a supernatural explanation for their baffling experiences was the location of some of the initial incidents. In early 1993, Tracy and Darren and their first child were living in a 300-year-old cottage which they rented from her parents. On one particular evening, and shortly before 9pm, each could hear a strange and urgent humming sound outside. They peered out of the window, but they could see nothing unusual. That was until an intensely bright light hit the cottage. It was so bright they could see nothing at all of their surroundings. The incident appeared to last for only seconds, but by the time the lights had vanished and the humming sound ceased, 15 minutes had gone by. The couple remained inside their property until the following morning when Darren would go outside to investigate. Under the safety of daylight, Darren would venture outside. A solid wrought iron fence around the garden of the property had been twisted and wrenched apart. He also discovered three large doors to outbuildings that had their heavy-duty padlocks ripped off and the doors swung open. They would find the doors open repeatedly during the course of the time they called the cottage home. Perhaps one of the most mystifying incidents would be when Tracy, after having been in and out of hospital due to a chest infection, would make a startling discovery. She was receiving daily visits due to an infected wound following her treatment. This went on for almost a month. Such was the severity of the wound, it was bandaged each day and secured in place by thick medical tape. One morning she awoke pain-free. When she reached to her chest, the bandage was no longer there, nor the wound infected. It appeared as though it had simply healed overnight. Incidentally, the bandage was nowhere to be found. Similar instances occurred with underwear Tracy had been wearing when going to bed. She would often awake the following morning with the pyjamas still on, but all her underwear removed. Like the bandage, they had seemingly vanished. Darren had his own bone-chilling encounter around the same time as Tracy had her chest infection. 
In the early hours one morning, still half asleep, he could see a figure by the window looking into their first aid box. He believed it to be Tracy, who must have gotten out of bed for more painkillers. Only when he lay back down and felt his wife beside him, did he realise it wasn't her. Sitting bolt upright and looking in the direction of the first aid box, the figure was now gone. The strange events would follow Tracy and Darren to their next home, and would steadily appear to increase in intensity. Doors would open and shut with a bang. Electrical devices and appliances would suddenly break for no reason. The toilet would even flush and taps would turn on under their own power. Tracy, on several occasions, would hear footsteps approaching, and even of someone walking right past her. One particular room in their house had a constant aroma of lavender. The room would also remain permanently cold, even with the heating turned up to full. A television in the room would also turn itself on regularly. When the family moved again to a house near the Yorkshire Moors, the activity again came with them. Both Tracy and Darren would regularly see strange lights over the moors. They would swoop down and back up and out of sight in an instant. One morning after Darren went to take a shower, Tracy went into the bathroom only seconds later for water. Her husband was not there. She called his name and searched frantically around the house but to no avail. When she raced back upstairs, he was back, walking out of the bathroom. Coincidentally or not, Darren would begin to experience increased instances of missing time. The couple's two-year-old son was also experiencing severe night terrors, and on one occasion, a strange four-fingered handprint was clearly visible on his torso. With such strange activity increasing, it was a relief when Darren was offered a contract to work in Dubai. In July 1997, Tracy and Darren and their four young children would move to Dubai. There had been several weeks' delay before Tracy and their children joined Darren. Interestingly, during this time, he experienced nothing out of the ordinary. However, upon his family's arrival, the bizarre experiences began again, almost instantly. Their son, Marcus, would begin telling his parents that a man lived in the light in his room. Furthermore, he would go into the light with his sister to talk and play. He also seemed to have knowledge of the roof of the house they were renting. He claimed that the man had told him that a water tank was on the roof, and there was. This not only worried Tracy and Darren, but there was no way he could have known this. Marcus's sister, Georgina, also began to experience strange visitors. She told Tracy of a bright light in her room, from which a strange man came out of. She would draw a picture of the man for Tracy, who would add several of her own to the collection. When she showed the pictures to Marcus, he immediately singled out the one his sister had drawn and stated this was the man in the light. As well as this increase in activity around the couple's children, the malfunctioning of electrical equipment also began again. Crockery would move across the kitchen table and even smash on the floor. Tracy and Georgina were sitting at the kitchen table one morning when Tracy suddenly realised she couldn't account for the previous 30 minutes. Throughout this period, Tracy remained in touch with Dodd via email. She would also keep a diary of such events. By December 1997, Tracy and the children would return to England and rent a house while waiting for Darren's contract to come to an end. The bizarre activities, however, would continue for Tracy and the children, in particular Marcus. An interesting point noted by the family was how each of them would often hear someone's voice clearly speaking to them, even though that person was not in the house. Was this an attempt by an entity to trick that person into communicating with them? Following the increase in activity, Tracy would agree to undergo hypnotic regression. She went back to the night her chest wound vanished. She would tell of waking up in her bed in the middle of the night. At the foot of the bed were two dark figures. Each wore a long hooded robe, which interestingly or not is a detail that often surfaces in such reports. She would also state that each of the figures had piercing bright blue eyes and white beards. Suddenly, she found herself on a table. She couldn't move, but there was nothing visible holding her down. She noticed a large needle descending towards her exposed chest, and red lights appeared to be coming from the needle. As the open wound on her chest and the needle connected, an intense burning sensation began. She could see the strange hooded figures in the room, but her head was locked in an upward position. It was at this point that Tracy was brought out of the session. The experience of Bob Rylance is remarkably similar to that of Tracy Jones. In fact, it would appear that his experience had likely gone on for decades. During that time, Rylance enjoyed a solid career in the military. 
However, he was played by bizarre experience, such as strange buzzing that would often awaken him late in the night. Footsteps would often sound out from the hallways outside his room. Whenever he did attempt to locate where these sounds were coming from, he would always find nobody there. Even as a small child, he would often awake with a feeling of terror surging through him and unable to move. Often, he could sense that a face was close by, looking at him. Perhaps what made these experiences even more unnerving was the fact that his mother would state that she too suffered from the same thing. The experiences would continue when he married. Family members would often see strange figures in their bedrooms while doors would open and close of their own accord. Even electrical devices would switch on by themselves or would even malfunction altogether. One bizarre experience would see Bob come downstairs to find his electric razor unpacked and plugged into a socket in the kitchen. He had only used it the previous evening in his bedroom where he had packed it away straight after. On occasion he would even find physical evidence of something strange taking place. Perhaps the strangest of these were the five brown water blisters that he discovered on each of his thighs. He had no knowledge of why they were there. Violence would eventually be put in contact with the aforementioned Tony Dodd, who would guide him through hypnotic regression sessions. These sessions would prove vital in filling out the many blanks in a lifetime of strange incidents. The background to many of the accounts was the same. Abductions would often take place in his room at the hands of strange creatures, and these creatures were not of this world, and the descriptions were essentially of grey aliens. They would subject him to various experiments, often performed in a sterile medical type room. He would even tell of being cured of a diseased part of his stomach. This information was given to him telepathically, a claim often made by abductees, while the creature put a triangular device on his torso. It is reasonable to suggest that some of the physical markings such as the blisters on his thighs were the result of these examinations and procedures. Since having the regression sessions, many more memories have returned to him. It is also worth our time examining just one more case of an apparent alien encounter that could equally sit well in the world of paranormal investigation, that of a woman known only as Julie from Carlisle in the United Kingdom, whose case was examined and investigated by the Birmingham UFO Group in early 2022. It would appear events began at some point in 2000, when Julie was only 12 years old. She was at home in her bedroom at around 9pm. As usual, she was reading a book, something she often did until quite late into the night, partly because she struggled to sleep, and partly because she had a fear of the dark and would often leave the light on in her room. On this particular evening, she noticed a sudden movement at the bottom of the bed and instinctively peered over the top of her book. To her shock and horror, from the corner of the bed came a black scaly arm with claws and white talons where the hand should have been. In fact, she noticed there was no actual wrist between this claw and the arm, which was much more muscular than a human arm. She stared at the arm for a moment longer, contemplating whether she was imagining it. However, she knew she wasn't, and she knew whatever it was, it was very real. What's more, although she didn't dare look, she had the impression that the creature the arm belonged to was at the foot of the bed. The arm continued to move across the bed, moving left to right. Then, right before her eyes, it simply vanished. She remained still, not daring to move in case a strange arm returned. After several moments, convinced it had gone, she let out a breath of air. Although the arm had startled her, she was not frightened. In fact, she simply went back to reading her book as if nothing had happened. She estimated the entire episode had lasted no longer than five or six seconds. In the days that followed, however, Julie began to sense an increase in feeling that there was a strange presence outside her room, a presence that could announce itself at any moment. This feeling became so strong that she even repositioned her bed in order that she faced the door. There are other intriguing details of the encounter. For example, after speaking to her at length about the incident, it was an investigator's impression that she truly did see something, and it wasn't a case of her simply imagining it. As he points out, this was not a fleeting glimpse, she stared at the arm clearly for several seconds. He also highlights how the seemingly bizarre position of the reptilian matches other similar accounts. For example, some people who have reported similar encounters often state that these strange entities are often crouched or laid down, reaching upwards to the witness. Even the colour of the reptilians with black scaly skin has been reported more than we might think, just like in this case, although many reports state the skin to be green or a bizarre off-white colour. 
There is also the possibility that Julie can't remember the entire incident. In fact, she may actually recall very little of it. In short, it is possible that what she recalled was the end of a reptilian abduction encounter. The fact that she was surprisingly calm despite the truly surreal nature of the incident perhaps also suggests this. What's more, many people who experience repeated abductions and strange encounters do so from an early age, similar to Julie. The investigator points out that the constant feeling that something was waiting outside her room about to enter may have been much more than a feeling. It could have been repressed memories of the encounter when the reptilian entity entered her room. Whatever the truth of the matter, this was just the first of many years of strange encounters and experiences. The following year, in 2001, Julie began experiencing many strange episodes that resonate with typically paranormal encounters, although they are also details that show up in cases of repeated alien abduction. For example, Julie began hearing strange footsteps in various parts of the house, even though there was clearly no one there. Doors would often open of their own accord, and she would often hear loud clattering noises. On one occasion, while she was looking straight at it, a photo frame turned itself around as if being guided by an invisible hand. Many poltergeist cases have similar details. Even more alarming, she would often see shadowy figures out of the corner of her eye. However, by the time she had turned around, there was nothing there. What's more, these shadowy figures often appear to be extraordinarily tall, much like many reptilians are reported to be. The more time went on, the more other people would also witness these strange incidents. Furthermore, they appeared not to be limited to the house itself. On one occasion, when her mother, who worked at a nursing home, could not find childcare for Julie and her brother, Steve, she was forced to take her children to work with her. She would make a bed for them on the staff sofa and then go about her duties. However, in the middle of the night, Julia woke to the sound of her mother comforting her crying brother. When she asked what had happened, she was told that her brother had woken up to see the tube of a hoover that was moving in the room by itself. More than scared by what he was seeing, he screamed out for his mother. When she entered the room, she too saw the hoover tube moving. She walked over to it and pushed the hoover with her foot, at which point it lost its animation and the tube fell to the ground. Another bizarre incident around the same time had an unsettling connection to the nursing home. One of the residents with whom both Julie and her brother were familiar, Dorothy, had passed away. However, several days later, while on his way to use the bathroom, Steve claims to have seen Dorothy sitting at their dining room table in the kitchen. Following this, Julie also began seeing strange moving entities in the kitchen, so much so that she became afraid to walk into the room or even past it. These were just several of the strange incidents witnessed by Julie and Steve. There were, however, many more encounters. By the time Julie was a young woman, she worked at a local hospital as a senior staff nurse, and the strange activity would follow her there one night in 2016. Julie would recall that one of the patients at the hospital had died that night. When family members who had been at their bedside had left, at around 2am, Julie and another nurse went about wrapping their body for collection to the morgue. As they were doing so, Julie happened to glance up at the window. To her horror, in the reflection, she could see a tall shadowy figure moving behind her from one side to the other. She further noticed a shuffling sound coming from the floor as if something was physically moving. Instinctively, Julie moved back in shock. When she did so, the other nurse looked in her direction. The look on her face told Julie that she too could see the shadowy form. Both of them left what they were doing and ran out of the room. They remained in the corridor for around 15 minutes before returning to the room. Much to their relief, when they did so, the ghostly presence was gone. They cautiously finished preparing the body and left the room in order to fill out the necessary paperwork. When they went to do so though, they realised that the form they needed had been left in the room with the deceased patient in their rush to get away. Julie returned to retrieve it. When she arrived in the room, she was stunned to find that the wrapping around the patient's body had been ripped away, leaving the dead man's head fully exposed. Although both nurses were beyond shocked and frightened by the events, they proceeded to rewrap the body and then left the room. No further incidents occurred, at least that night. Much more recently, in 2021, Julie experienced another truly bizarre encounter while performing her duties at work. On this particular evening, at about 1am, she was transferring a patient from one ward to another. As she was doing so, however, she suddenly noticed the shadowy form of a young woman that appeared to have very blonde hair. 
This form was moving toward a sink in the room. To begin with, she thought it was a patient with a similar appearance who would often leave her bed at night. She turned around expecting to see her and to escort her back to her bed. However, to her utter shock, there was no one there. She spun her head back around and saw the faces of the other nurses. They too had clearly seen the shadowy figure. The nurses left the ward they were on, confused as to what they had just witnessed. Each of the other nurses recognised a similarity to the patient Julie initially thought she had seen. Realising that it was impossible for the patient to have been there and just disappear, they began to contemplate whether the patient might have passed away and they had witnessed her spirit. However, a quick check confirmed this was not the case. Just what it was the three nurses witnessed that evening remains unknown. Might this have been another case of whatever potential shape-shifting entity that has plagued Julie throughout her life taking the form of someone she thought she knew? Indeed, had Julie and her family been at the centre of repeat alien abductions that stretched across several decades, and were the paranormal episodes they experienced a part of these? There is then clearly a lot to contemplate when considering if there are indeed connections between UFO and alien encounters and the world of the paranormal. Are, for example, ghosts, shadow people and what we would understand as demons the same entities as extraterrestrials? There certainly appears to be more than enough crossovers and connections to investigate further. And what might they mean? Might it be, as in other aspects of history, that these strange occurrences and phenomena are simply different perspectives? And if that is the case, then should we ask, are these strange creatures from another world somewhere far away, or do they hail from an alternative dimension? Once more, these two things could easily be the same thing. For example, might space travel, in terms of the vast distances required to reach other worlds, be one and the same with creating portals and opening doorways to other realms of existence? Might time and space quite literally go hand in hand? as bizarre and even nonsensical a notion as it might be to some. Could it be that time travel, space travel and stepping into another dimension are all part of the same road? The two areas of interest will keep researchers frustrated and fascinated for generations. That there is something to investigate is beyond doubt, and maybe one day we will find the answers humanity has sought since the beginning of time. For now I'll simply thank you for joining me and be sure to leave any thoughts in the comments and check out the links for further reading on some of the theories we have been discussing here today. Remember to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media to keep up to date on future podcasts, articles and videos and as always if there is anything you want us to feature on future podcast episodes then simply get in touch at marcus at ufoinsight.com. Until next time, goodbye and take care. Thank <music> you.